As we've said in previous studies, it's helpful, is it not, to be able to build layers. In our session yesterday, we looked at the theme of the Lord as our absent bridegroom. This is someone who's different to the commander of the angels, and someone yet again who's different to the priestly intercessor for the saints. And we talked about the need to build our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ in much the same way, I suppose, as we talk about building a relationship with the Father. And we explain, do we not, brothers and sisters, how that by means of the Word of God, the Father speaks with us, and by means of prayer to the Father, we speak with Him. And in that two-way process, we build a relationship. Well, so must we build a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's helpful, is it not, to be able to focus, as we have, over the course of this Bible school, on the current work and role of Christ, that we might see him in these different facets and different aspects. Well, this morning is interesting because because now we come to another completely different face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it's the Gospel of John, isn't it, that reveals in Christ the face of the eagle. We're not going to turn to that just now, but we shall before we conclude our consideration. And in the Gospel of John, we see the Lord as the face of the eagle, which is the face of the perfect judge. And we remind ourselves that our Lord has that aspect about his labors, both currently and in the future. In fact, one could argue, and absolutely biblically, that the Lord has been busy judging the nations ever since AD 70 when he came with the Roman armies to execute judgment upon the Jewish aeon and to overthrow it absolutely. We know that the book of Daniel and the book of Matthew tells us that the the judgment would come. And we believe that that judgment was orchestrated by our Lord Jesus Christ in company with the angels. Whether or not he sent the Paracletos to accomplish it as immaterial, it was the Lord's work, so that in a very real sense, Christ has been judge for some time. The mere fact that he has not yet returned to judge the nations does not change the fact that judgment has already been committed to the Son. In the 2nd of Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 10, we're told of the terror of the Lord. In the 2nd of Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, we're told of the vengeance in flaming fire of Jesus. In Revelation, chapter 6, verse 16, we're told of the wrath of the Lamb. So here then are aspects of our Lord in different manifestation. This is really a counterbalance, isn't it, to the aspect of the bridegroom. And I think that what this face, what this aspect of Christ reminds us is that whilst the Lord is the manifestation of divine love and compassionate care, he's also the upholder of divine truth. And he is the executor of divine justice. And the same one who is our priestly intercessor. And our absent bridegroom is also an appointed judge. It's as well, brothers and sisters, that we don't forget that, isn't it? In terms of our relationship with him. Now, of course, as with all of these themes, there's an Old Testament background. And, of course, there are many passages in the Old Testament that suggest that the work of judgment is is going to be given to the Son who will execute on behalf of the Father. In the prayer of Hannah, for example, in the first of Samuel in chapter 2, we will be told, Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them, Yahweh shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king. And perhaps implicit in the idea of the prayer of Hannah was the king himself would be the one to execute the judgment of God. And divine strength would be given to this king. In fact, I think that's the first place where the word Messiah occurs in the biblical record. The anointed one of God through whom the 
these judgments would be executed, thundered upon the earth. They're yet to come, brothers and sisters, and they come by the hand of the Son of God, who's the King, granted strength. And in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Psalms, if you come with me to Psalm 82, we're told that the there is a, an interesting reference here because Psalm 82 is quoted by our Lord Jesus Christ in none other than the book of John, which we believe is the face of the judge. And in John's Gospel, perhaps peculiarly in John's Gospel, this psalm is referred to because it's all about judgment, you see. Psalm 82 verse 1 says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? And so Psalm 82 is an indictment upon the judges of the nation who fail to live up to their responsibilities as judges of the people of God. They're described as gods in verse 1 because, because they judged on behalf of God, but they didn't execute judgment and justice. And so verse 6 says, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but the reality is, because you have not upheld the divine principles of wise and proper judgment, ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And then the psalm ends with the words that we've quoted on the screen, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. And even the language of verse 8 would suggest to us, would it not, brothers and sisters, that the execution of this judgment that the psalm calls upon is to be administered by the Son, who will be the inheritor of the nations. And so the psalm calls upon that righteous one to arise, who will judge whether, whether, whether the human judges of the earth have not fulfilled their responsibility. This one to come will, he will judge, he will judge righteously and inherit the nations as a consequence. And this is our Lord Jesus Christ, which was for to come. And just a few pages on in Psalm 96, you'll recall that there are a series of psalms that uh, we might call the Yahweh reigneth psalms. There's a series of passages where that expression is used. It's found in Psalm 93 in verse 1, Yahweh reigneth. It's found in Psalm 97 in verse 1, Yahweh reigneth. In Psalm 99 verse 1, Yahweh reigneth. It's found in Psalm 96 and verse 10. And in Psalm 96 verse 10 it says, Say among the heathen that Yahweh reigneth, the world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before Yahweh for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Now what's interesting about that reference, brothers and sisters, in these Psalms, is that we have warrant in the New Testament to understand the Yahweh that reigns as none other than our Lord Jesus Christ at his return. And the reason for that, which we shan't turn up, but Psalm 97 is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 1 and applied to Christ. Do you remember that phrase in Hebrews 1 when it says, Again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels worship him. It's a quotation from Psalm 97. He's using it to prove that the angels will in fact worship our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, probably do so now, brothers and sisters, because of his exalted status. But Paul quotes Psalm 97, which begins with the words, Yahweh reigneth, and Paul says, No, that's our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. It is the Lord that will be the manifestation of Yahweh in the earth. He will reign on behalf of his Father. And so the one of Psalm 96 who comes to judge righteously, he cometh, he cometh to judge the world in righteousness, is our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, on behalf of his Father, true enough. But Christ himself will be the judge of all the earth. And I wonder when we come to the book of Acts, 
and to the 17th, 17th chapter, and to those famous words of the Apostle Paul, when on Mars Hill he was to say this, in Acts 17 and verse 30, For in him we live and move and have our being, we are his offspring. For as much then he says in Acts 17 verse 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And I wonder whether that phrase, he will judge the world in righteousness in Acts chapter 17, may not come straight from Psalm 96. He comes, he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And the Apostle Paul in expounding these things says, God has appointed not just a day, verse 31, but a man. He's appointed a man who will execute those judgments. He commands all men everywhere to repent. And so when our title of this slide says, Christ the appointed judge of the nations, the real force of that phrase, brothers and sisters, is it not, is that Christ truly is the judge of all mankind. All the world will come under the righteous judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns all men everywhere, says the Apostle Paul, judged by this one man whom God has ordained and appointed and who will come in the fullness of God's good time. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes, you see. And yet when we really come to the New Testament and focus on the work of Christ as judge, the interesting thing is that the focus is not really on the judgment of the world at all. The interest of the New Testament writers and of the epistles is not really on Christ as the appointed judge of the nations. No, no, the focus of the New Testament is much narrower. Well, let me show you a passage, Acts chapter 10. Three interesting passages because they all use the same key code phrase. What do you think this means, brothers and sisters? In Acts chapter 10, it says this, verse 42. And he commanded us, says Peter, he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Or as the New American Standard Bible says, to testify that this is the one, this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of quick and dead, of the living and the dead. Of course, the word quick here the old English word simply means living. The living and the dead. He's the judge of the living and the dead. And yet the moment you think about that expression, brothers and sisters, you realize that this cannot be about the Lord as judge of all the nations, all the world, all men, everywhere, because, because Christ isn't going to raise all the nations. He's not going to raise all the dead of the nations, is he? That one who's the judge of the living and the dead is only the judge of those who are responsible, living and dead. Isn't that the force of that phrase, brothers and sisters? This is not the judge of the nations in Acts 10 verse 42. This is the judge of the living and the dead. These are the accountable. Now, in the second of Timothy in chapter 4, you'll remember that the apostle Paul uses a similar expression. In fact, a remarkably similar expression as it turns out, because in the second of Timothy chapter 4, the record says, verse 1, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge why the living and the dead, there it is again, 
He shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. So you notice that the focus of this one who comes to judge the living and the dead is that in some way is associated both with his appearing, I think that's significant, and also with the matters of his kingdom. And of course the obvious answer, the obvious reason, is because the living and the dead are related to the kingdom. These are the people of the kingdom, the potential candidates for the kingdom, both living and dead. That's the only focus of this passage. This is not the judge of the world. This is just the judge of the living and the dead who are responsible before him. And when he comes, and before his kingdom is established, these ones living and dead must come before him. And now come to the third passage in the first of Peter chapter 4. So Peter says it in Acts 10, And Paul mentions it in 2 Timothy 4. And Peter refers to it again in his epistle in the first of Peter chapter 4. And he says this, maybe reading from verse 3 for, for context. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you don't still run with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you, of you who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the living and the dead. See, these are the saints, aren't they, brothers and sisters, the responsible ones. Those who once were Gentiles, verse 3, but have now learned to live to the will of God, verse 2, because they've been taught the knowledge of the truth. And notice verse 5, there's a really interesting word in verse 5, who shall give account of him that is ready. Did you notice that? He's ready even now, brothers and sisters. Have we ever thought about that? The Lord's ready right now to judge us. And in a sense, he does, as we shall see by and by. The Lord's not just going to come and judge it as appearing in his kingdom, although that's absolutely true, but he's ready now, says Peter, right now, in a sense, to judge the living and the dead. The question is, how might that principle be outworked in our lives of the judge who even now is ready to judge the living and the dead? Well, that's Let's just have a look at this slide and summarize that because I think that leads to our our last passage, which I'm sure is connected to these three. So Acts chapter 10, verse 42, the second of Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, and the first of Peter chapter 4, verse 5, all about he who is to be the judge of the living and the dead. And now come to um, to the book of Romans in chapter 14. Because here's our last passage, and you'll see now perhaps the connection of this passage in Romans 14 with those that we've already reviewed. Because it's in Romans 14, is it not? That reference is now going to be made to the judgment seat of Christ. And how interesting, in connection with the judgment seat of Christ, that the record says this. Verse 9 for to this end Christ both died and rose and re- rose and revived that he might be lord both of the dead and the living but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set at naught thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ actually i didn't really read that correctly did i shall i just change that emphasis slightly for we shall all We shall all stand. Who's the we? Well, I think it's the living and the dead. You see a verse 9. It's the whole group of those responsible and accountable, both living and dead. We, we ones, we shall all, every one of us, without exception, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Christ is Lord of all these and will demand that they come before him. So all of a sudden, you see, that the idea of Christ as a judge becomes a lot more personal, doesn't it? When we narrow the focus from Christ, the judge of all the nations, to Christ, the judge now of the living and the dead, 
a group that we now ourselves find that we're related to. And I think there is a principle in the scripture that makes it clear that when our Lord returns, Christ will be the judge of his household first. I think there's a clear Bible principle that's established here, that this becomes the very first matter of the whole process of divine judgment that's outworked by the Lord at his return. First and foremost comes the judgment of his own household. Even though he is the appointed judge of the nations, I think there is a sense, brothers and sisters, a very real sense, in which the judge's most important work is the judgment of his own household. And this becomes the the first sign of all the judgment that's to flow. But it begins here, starts here, brothers and sisters, it starts with us. And the resurrection marks the beginning of the judgment epoch. It's this period of time that marks a series of judgment events which will usher in the kingdom. And the first stage, the very first stage of this epoch is going to be the judgment of the household. And I think, by the way, that one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons why the Lord begins his whole time of judgment with his own with his own responsible ones is because from the household of faith, the immortal saints shall be made up who will go forth with Christ to execute all the other judgments to come. So I'll just say that again, because I think that's important. It's from the household that the immortal saints will be made up who will then go forth to execute all the rest of God's judgments in company with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's Christ and the saints that execute judgment upon the nations. But before the saints can execute judgment, they must themselves first be judged. Now, come and have a look at just two or three references to establish this idea. We'll start with an Old Testament one first. It's in the book of Isaiah in chapter 26. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 19. It says in verse 19 of Isaiah 26, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead bodies shall they arise. Some of you may know that it's quite helpful in this verse to delete the italics And so rather than having the word men, we would delete the word men in the first line and also the words together with. So that in fact how the verse would read, and and I think more intelligibly is, thy dead shall live, my dead body shall they arise. And then perhaps another helpful thing with regard to the passage, brothers and sisters, is to suggest that the word thy relates to God and the word my relates relates to Christ. In other words, it's like there's two speakers here. It's God that speaks the first line and the son that responds with the second line. So God says, thy dead shall live. And the Lord says in response, yea, my dead body, my dead community, they shall arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. This is, this is the moment of the resurrection, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The body of Christ. All of those who will be brought forth. And then verse 20 says this, notice, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut the doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, for behold, Yahweh cometh out of his place, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquities. So you notice the sequence, brothers and sisters. The resurrection of the dead ones, verse 19, a period of privacy and seclusion with the Lord, verse 20, and then the subsequent outpouring of judgments upon the nations for their iniquity, verse 21. And I think that's the sequence, you see, of the judgment process. The dead are raised those that are responsible, they enter into a period of privacy and of personal judgment with the Lord within the chamber, verse 20, and then they come forth to execute judgments upon the nations with our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to John chapter 5. 
The book of John chapter 5 has something similar to say. It suggests also that the resurrection marks the beginning of this judgment epoch and that not only does it mark the beginning of the judgment epoch but that the first to be judged are the saints themselves. John 5 says this in verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So the Lord has authority to execute judgment. So the question is, brothers and sisters, how and when and in what order will the Lord execute the judgment that he now has authority to perform? And verse 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Now, of course, we know that we understand not all in the graves shall come forth. Those that are in the graves that come forth are those that are called forth for a reason, because they must come, living and dead, to the judgment seat of Christ. So all those, all those ones that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of... Now, when it says condemnation or damnation there, that's actually the same word rendered judgment in verse 27. They come forth to the resurrection of judgment. Of course, we understand that that judgment in this case will also result in their condemnation since these are not raised to life but to death. So what's the sequence, brothers and sisters? The Lord has authority to execute judgment, but the first thing he does is he raises the dead and brings them to judgment. That's how the whole process of the Lord executing his authority as judge will begin, says John chapter 5, the household first. Then all others shall follow after. One final reference in the book of Revelation in chapter 11. In Revelation chapter 11, we've got a a similar idea, I think, uh, when it says this. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 16 says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. So how did all this come about then? Verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And then once that's done, once they've been raised, once they've been judged, once they've been rewarded, that then thou shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. And now the judgments are poured out upon the rest of a world that stand that stand guilty before God for their iniquity and their wickedness before him and for their destruction of the very earth which was given into their guardian care from the time of Genesis. The nations were wroth, sorry, the nations were angry, thy wrath is come, but before that wrath is poured out upon destroying those that destroy the earth, first, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thy servants given reward. So I think there's a sequence of ideas here, you see. And by the way, why that could be helpful is because there is some debate in the brotherhood about the sequence, a suggestion that some of the work of judgment occurs before the saints are ever raised. I don't think that's right, brothers and sisters. I think that this is the correct order. I think it begins at the very start with the judgment of the household. And I think we know that for another reason. I think we have another line of reasoning as to why we believe that the focus of the judgment is, in fact, upon the household. I think that those with greatest responsibility are held first accountable. And that principle was going to be established in both the Babylonian overthrow of the Old Testament and the Roman overthrow of the New Testament and its impact upon the believers of that age. Now, come and have a look at Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9 is a reference to that dramatic and tragic moment 
when the judgment of God was to fall upon the house of Israel because they had corrupted his way. And we're told in Ezekiel chapter 9 of those mysterious six men that came from the way of the higher gate that lies towards the north. And, and interestingly enough, brothers and sisters, we believe that the six men of, of Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 2 in all probability relate to the judgment that would, that would be brought by Babylon upon a guilty Israel. You may just care to take a note of a cross-reference in Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse 3, which says that when the king of Babylon came in the days of Zedekiah, there were six Babylonian princes mentioned as bringing the judgments upon the nation. Jeremiah 39 verse 3, I think it answers to the six men of Ezekiel chapter 9. But in the midst of them is another man, another man clothed with linen, it says in Ezekiel 9 verse 2, making a seventh man. And this seventh man bears the clothing of the high priest on the day of atonement. Oh yes, this was going to be a, a day of atonement indeed for the nation. And verse 4 says, Yahweh said unto this man, the one clothed with linen, with the writer's inkhorn, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And that setting of the mark in the forehead, brothers and sisters, is it not as reminiscent of the mark of the blood upon the lintel in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13 on Passover night, that the judgment might overpass them. But this mark on the forehead here is because each individual is marked by their mental disposition towards divine principles and what they think and feel and love and believe about the truth. Go and mark them in the foreheads, those that are genuine for my truth, he says. And then verse 5 says, and to the others, so who's the others? Well, that's the six men who are going to execute judgment. To the others, he said, in mine hearing, Go ye after him, the seventh, go through the city and smite, let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin, begin at my sanctuary, was the cry of the prophet on behalf of God. Judgment begins here, brothers and sisters, at the sanctuary of God. And the mark is upon those who shall be saved. And notice this, brothers and sisters, the man, the man clothed in linen with the writer's inkhorn, he already knows those whom he has marked. He knows those whose mental disposition will save them. But the rest shall suffer the judgment of those that came forth. And they began, they, they began at the sanctuary of God, you see. Now, why that's interesting is because if you come to the New Testament record, do you remember that there's a New Testament passage in the first epistle of Peter in chapter 4, which has this rather interesting expression. And I'm sure, brothers and sisters, even though it's not in our Bible margins, that this is where Peter is quoting from. Ezekiel 9 is the Babylonian overthrow. But the first of Peter chapter 4 is about the impending Roman overthrow and the calamitous judgments of AD 70 that were to come upon not just the Jewish nation, but persecution upon the saints at the same time of difficulty. And first of Peter chapter 4 verse 17 says, For the time is come that judgment must Begin at the house of God. Now, where does that expression come from? It must begin at the house of God. See, that's Ezekiel chapter 9, isn't it? Begin at my sanctuary, said the prophet. Those with greatest responsibility are first held accountable. And as the record says in, in Peter, and if at first begin at us, 
What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? It was Brother Thomas that talked about those categories, was it not? That in the matter of responsibility and accountability for the truth, the righteous uphold it, the ungodly disgrace it, the sinners reject it. But the judge knows them all, brothers and sisters. Every one of them, living or dead, and the judgment begins at the sanctuary of God. And there's something very personal about this, isn't there? And um, you see, only those marked in the forehead as having the mental disposition of the truth will be saved by the judge. And that mark in the forehead of, of Ezekiel chapter 9 finds its counterbalance, does it not, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1 and Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4 where the record says concerning those that are redeemed and they had the Father's name written in their foreheads, says Revelation. That's the mark of the man clothed in linen, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The mark of the man clothed in linen that they might be saved. How absolutely vital that we develop that disposition of the truth now that will win the approval of the judge. If we do not have that mark upon us, brothers and sisters, nothing can spare us when the judgment begins at the sanctuary. Nothing at all can spare us if we have not that saving mark. And that really brings us to, the, to, the, to our, our next idea, you see, which is this. That just as the man in Ezekiel knew those whom he would affix the mark to, so our Lord Jesus Christ knows. There's a reference, you know, in both Old and New Testament to the book of life. The book of life is the Spirit's record of the remnant of the woman's seed down through time. It's found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Here's, um, here's three passages from the Old Testament. We haven't got time to refer to them all, but can I just ask you to turn two of them up so that we might see the point of the book of life. In Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Exodus, in Exodus chapter 32, you'll remember some famous words of Moses. Exodus 32, when Moses intercedes for the nation. And he says this, you know, I can remember even as a boy, even as a child, being intrigued by this particular verse in my Bible, brothers and sisters. I have a son, by the way. My youngest son is um, what I might call a detail man. He has a, you know how in the marginal references you have A, B, C, D, E, F, the marginal references? My son has a note in the back of his Bible of where, what margins in his Bible have missed one of the letters of the alphabet out in the marginal references? My son has a note of certain verses where the full stop is missing in the printed version. Amazing. But I remember as a child being intrigued by this one in Exodus 32. Didn't you, brothers and sisters? Verse 32 of chapter 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, dash, oh, is that an inspired dash? Is that dash in the text, brothers and sisters? Well, it's a funny thing, but if you look up the NASB or the NIV or the RSV, you'll find they've all got the dash in them. So I don't know whether that dash is actually in the Hebrew text. It might be. There may be some marking in the Hebrew text which occasioned this printing in the authorized version, and that little dash is there. It's like a pause, isn't it? Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and Moses leaves it hanging, and then says, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. What a marvelous spirit was the spirit of this man who would offer himself for the nation. But the near kinsman had not yet come. It wasn't Moses' role, was it, to be that, that near kinsman. And so the record says that Yahweh said to Moses, verse 33, Whosoever hath sinned against me, 
Him will I blot out of my book. So the names are written in the book. The real issue, brothers and sisters, are not whether our names are written in the book. The real thing to concern us is whether our names will be blotted out of the book. Did you notice that? That's the real burning question, isn't it, of, of these records. Well, Psalm 69 says something, something similar, which we won't turn up. Let their names be blotted out of the book and not written with the righteous, it says. Daniel chapter 12, that they were delivered. Everyone whose name was found written in the book. And again, in the New Testament record, in Luke chapter 10, Philippians chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 12, we have allusion to those that are written in heaven, written, well, let's look, look up one of those, shall we? Philippians chapter chapter 4. So just one of those New Testament records. Philippians 4 says this, verse 3, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life, he says. Their names are in the book of life. You know, that must be one of the most astonishingly wonderful things for us all to contemplate, brothers and sisters, that our name is written in the book of life. What an amazing thought. But what's interesting about this book of life is this. In the apocalypse, that book of life is described as belonging to the Lamb. It is the Lamb's book of life. We're expressly told that. It's the Lamb's book of life. Belongs to him, brothers and sisters. It belongs to the judge. And I'll tell you why it belongs to the judge. It belongs to the judge for this reason, this singularly important reason, for these words which the Lord said on one occasion. I'll give you the words, and then you can note the reference. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Christ has been given power over all flesh to give eternal life to as many as he chooses. Brothers and sisters, he has the book of life. It's in the Lamb's hands. He knows the list, brothers and sisters. He knows every single name. So the real question is, will our name remain or will it be blotted out by the judge? Well, I'd like you to come back uh, to John chapter 5 just before we conclude our study. Because uh, I suppose that the force of John chapter 5 here is to suggest this, brothers and sisters, that in a very real sense, we need to see, we need to think, we need to comprehend the notion of our Lord Jesus Christ, not just being a judge in the future, but being our judge right now. John 5 verse 22 says, For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth my word, says the judge, and believes on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, it's the same word, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Ah, from death to life, the living and the dead. And we suddenly realize that the living and the dead might not just be the literal living and the dead, it could be the spiritual living and the dead. And the real issue is not whether we're dead or alive literally, but whether we will finally be living before the judge in the sense of passing into eternal life. And the judge has that power, brothers and sisters. This judge has the power to give eternal life. And he says this, verse 25. Oh, you've got to read this ever so carefully. Read verse 28 first. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. We read that earlier. The Lord's coming, brothers and sisters. But do you see what verse 25 says? Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God 
and they that hear shall live eternally. The hour is now, brothers and sisters. Now, says the Lord, now is the time to hear the voice of the judge. And those that are dead that hear that voice now in their present lives shall live eternally. They've passed from death to life, verse 24, because they've heard the voice of the judge. I just want to tell you a little story. You've probably heard this story before, but I've always thought it was a wonderful thing, wonderful story. I think a true one, by the way, and a very piece, a very helpful piece of counsel for parents and children. It's a story of a little girl that came to her mother that so desperately wanted to go to a school dance. She had just come to that flowerhood of, of time where she was not a little girl anymore, but a young woman with all the hopes and fears and aspirations that opened up before her in life. It was a school dance. She was old enough to dance, and she knew how to dance. The little girl in the truth, you see. And her mother said, well, I'm not sure, really, what, what the dance will be like in terms of the people that come, the music that will be played, the jokes that will be told, the atmosphere of the place, because this little girl had grown up in a household of the truth. So what the mother said to her little girl, that wasn't a little girl really anymore, she was a young lady and a woman. She said, well, I'll tell you what. How about you go on this one proviso, that when you walk in the door to the dance, the school dance, I want you to think that you've got Christ on your arm. And as long as you feel that Christ will be happy there, then you may enjoy the dance. And so the girl went off. And about 30 minutes later, she came home, walked down the street, and her mother said, what was the dance like, dear? And the young lady said, well, she said, I really don't think that Christ wanted to be there. I think that's the lesson, you see, of John 5, is it not, brothers and sisters, is there's no point in seeing Christ as some distant judge in the future. We need to feel his loving but careful eyes upon us now. Verse 25. We need to hear his voice cautioning us now. Verse 25. We need to know his deepest scrutiny of our heart now. Verse 25. We need to confess our sins frequently and oft in full acknowledgement of the judge's stare now. Right now, brothers and sisters. Because that's what's happening, you see. Right now, the book of life is in preparation. The judgment seat is only going to constitute the revelation and the confirmation of what the Son of God already knows. It's only to reveal to us. The Son already knows, brothers and sisters. Remember that marvelous passage in the second of Timothy, the Lord knows them that are his. He already does. The judge of his own household is scrutinizing the lives of the saints now, and the judgment seat of Christ will reveal whether our names have remained written or been blotted out of the book, but our status is already known to Christ as the appointed judge who knows whose are his. Well, that's how we need to see, I think, the judge of all the world. We need to see him as the judge of our present lives and actions. Every day, brothers and sisters, we live under the shadow of the judge. Every day, this book, this piece of music, this conversation, this friend, this place that we shall go, imagine that we've got the Lord walking with us as our judge as long as he's happy to be there and we're happy to be with him. Then you'll be safe in all that you do. Don't you think, brothers and sisters? So let's see him that way and be thankful for his judgment. As a hymn says, But though from his glorious face heaven shall fade and earth shall fly, fear not ye, his chosen race, your redemption draweth nigh.